and Saul Steinberg. Currently, we have Laurent de Brunoff of Babar fame. As Peter was a musician, my thoughts immediately go to our early member, Lorenzo da Ponte, Mozart's librettist, who ended up in New York City and was a teacher, bookseller, and philosopher. He founded the first opera house in New York City in 1830. The library still has part of his book collection. To help support our wonderful library and all its great services, please be sure to give generously. Remember, your membership fees cover about a third of the expenses. And it's such a pleasure to welcome Peter Mendelssohn here. I remember him so fondly from his time working at Books and Company, where his grandmother, Barbara Gimbel, had a charge account and was a lovely customer. <laughs> at that point, um, he was a musician, and now he is associate art director of Alfred Knopf, the art director of Pantheon Books, and the director of Vertical Press. His designs have been described as instantly recognized and iconic book covers. We all remember his cover for The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. His book, What We See When We Read, ex explores the reading experience. His Kirkus Review closes with, in 19 brief, zesty chapters, the author considers such topics as the relationship of reading to time, skill, fantasy, and belief. Mendelssohn attains his goal to produce a fresh, quirky, and altogether delightful meditation on the miraculous art of reading. His book covers his thoughts behind his covers. In discussing Lolita, should he represent the central sexual relationship between a young girl and an older man? Or, Mr. Mendelssohn states, are we being asked to delve deeper? I would vote for the latter. After all, how impoverished would our book design jobs be if we didn't delve deeper, if we didn't interpret, if we didn't visually translate what is most essential in a book? According to all the glowing reviews, Peter has certainly succeeded in this. From the Washington Post, cover its visually enticing tour of some of the most important books of our time, made even more memorable by Mr. Mendelssohn's daring covers. I will close with this remark by the legendary Chip Kidd. Peter Mendelssohn has the ability to visually and conceptually distill a narrative in such a way that it seems effortlessly, effortlessly inventive, striking, smart, fresh, and yet classic. And he does it again and again and again. How I hate him. Yeah. <laughs> and now let us welcome Peter Mendelssohn. Thanks, Jeanette. This is so weird. Yeah, um, so Jeanette hired me, um, I was trying to figure it out right before we started, about 13 or 14 years ago. Um, let me, let me uh, when she used to run this incredible bookstore called Books and Company, the people in this room know that bookstore on Madison Avenue. It was a real institution, one of the best bookstores in the world, and I was proud to work there for Jeanette. Um, no talking at the register. <laughs> um, so let me backtrack a little bit and tell you a little bit about who I am and where I got, and how I got to the place I am right now, um, which is a little strange. I've done a lot of these talks, but none of them with my mother and grandmother in the room. So they sort of know how I got where I got. So you guys are just going to tune out, and in about 10 minutes, you can tune back in again. So <clears throat> the bullet points are these. I started playing the piano when I was about five. and. At around 9 or 10, I discovered uh, an album that belonged to my grandfather that was called The Chopin I Love by Arthur Rubinstein. And of all the cliched things in the world, I heard him play the G minor Chopin Ballade, and I fell in love with it. And from that moment forward, there was nothing else I wanted to do. I wanted to just play the piano like that. And although I've kicked around from sort of obsession to obsession and job to job over the years, the one real constant has been that I've been practicing the piano every day, at least two hours a day, when I was in conservatory and grad school for 10 hours a day. Um, but it has really been the sort of focus of my attention, and it's been the, the goal 
for me was to be a classical pianist. And I was a classical pianist for several years. Um, and uh, around the time that I had met Jeanette and was working in the bookstore, uh, my first daughter was born and for various reasons, some of them financial and some of them just, I needed to change things up because it's a very hard road to hoe. Anybody who knows anything about classical music, it's one of those professions like being a professional figure skater or, you know, there's certain kinds of jobs that just require an intense amount of both discipline and solitude. And, uh, you know, I loved doing the work, but the solitude eventually started to get to me and it's just hard to make a living, um, especially if you have a family and you need health insurance. And so uh, the upshot of that was that, you know, in my early 30s, I sat down with my wife and brainstormed about other things that I could do besides play the piano. Um, and it was a pretty pathetic list of things. Um, and I remember being absolutely convinced at the time that I, I just had no marketable skills whatsoever. Not to mention that I just was a very poor citizen of the world. I just hadn't been out much. You know, you get to be kind of a shut-in when you're practicing all day long. Um, but, you know, my incredibly astute and lovely wife uh, mentioned the fact that I'm a visual person. I've always liked to draw. I've taken lots of art classes. There's many visual people in my family. My mother works at the Metropolitan Museum. My father was, excuse me, an architect and a painter and sculptor. My sister is a painter. There's art in the family. Um, I just always considered myself to be the anomaly. You know, everyone else, we'd go to museums and everybody was so visually astute and I was sort of the ears guy, the music guy. Um, but still I drew and I made things and uh, Carla, my wife, said, well, what about something visual? And eventually somehow the word design came up in that conversation and so over a period of about eight or nine months, I taught myself design. And I did that by going to Barnes & Noble and buying books on how to become a graphic designer. It's the silliest thing in the world. Um, which is really to say that there's no reason that anybody should go to a design school. It's really a waste of your money. It's not such a hard thing to learn because I am no genius. It's just, um, uh, it's not a very steep learning curve. Uh, but I worked at this long enough to sort of make a portfolio that was weak, but serviceable, and the first interview I had was with the aforementioned Chip Kidd, who is uh, an art director at Knopf, um, who was a friend of a friend, and my mother, um, you know, my mother and grandmother always are paving the way for me, whatever it is, they just, they open the doors, they smooth the groundwork. Um, so I got in to see Chip, and he looked at my book, and about six days later, I had my first um, an only really legitimate job that wasn't playing the piano and that was 13 years ago and here I am. So a thousand plus covers later. Um, and then there's been another funny little turn in the story which is just I was asked to make a monograph of my own work about uh, a little over a year ago by a publishing house and I agreed to do that and in a strangely neurotic panic I thought okay, I'm going to put all these pictures of these things that I've made out into the world, but I have this other side of me, this sort of thinking side, this, this literary, the reader part of me that wants expression and well, people think I'm a pretty pictures person and, you know, well, they think I'm shallow. I should probably put out another book. So I, I'm diseased in some way. So um, I gave myself a week or so to look through the writings that I'd done, various blog posts and articles for various places and so I just looked through them see if any of them would be profitable in terms of, you know, a book proposal. And, you know, there was a blog post that I wrote a couple months before that that was called What We See When We Read, which was just sort of a brief uh, and breezy kind of, as much as a phenomenology can be called breezy, it was an examination of the feeling of reading, um, how it differs from the myths and metaphors that we use to describe the experience, just what the experience is like if you introspect while doing it, if such a thing is possible. Um, and so unpacking that idea seemed profitable and people seemed to like the blog post. So I said, okay, one week, I'll see if I can find an editor who's interested and if no one buys it, not the end of the world. So the first editor I gave it to was put an offer on the table and then all of a sudden I had two books to put together in nine months. They both came out August 5th, so cover and what we see when we read. And one of them is predominantly pictures with some essays about uh, my design process. And the other is you know, really just a book about reading, about how these strange feats of imagination 
uh, are accomplished. And it's a bit of a rumination on sort of who owns the reading experience, who presides over it, the idea of co-creation between authors and readers, and um, there's a lot of reader response theory in it, and it was incredibly fun to write. So anyway, um, I thought what I'd do, given how much time we have today, is that I would show you a bunch of eye candy and as long as my computer, I don't have a power cord, so it might die, in which case I'll just tap dance or something. Um, I'll try to get through some pictures really quickly, and it'll show you sort of the, you know, the bulk of the kinds of work that I do at Knopf and Pantheon and Random House and Penguin and all the other places where I work. Um, and then I thought, if, if we still have power, that um, I would show you some ongoing projects that will illuminate the process a little bit, because I think that's always interesting to people who don't, you know, they don't, being a book cover designer is a pretty esoteric job, and most people don't know sort of what, what happens when you do it, what the process looks like. So um, I'll show you some of that and some forthcoming things as well. So um, I'm going to step over there um, in order to be able to click through the shows. Uh, so maybe I'll just take this, should I take this with me or? Yeah, all right. I hope the cord is long enough. How y'all doing? Good? Sorry, this is a little awkward, but it's the best we could do. No, thank you. I think that's, I think I could probably do this one-handed. No, this is, I think this is fine. Let's do that and do this. Okay, we got through the high on Peter part. That's good, that'll save us. Okay, so some work. Um, so this is uh, the cover that for a while was the only thing that I was known for doing, um, which was both wonderful and also kind of awkward, um, mainly because I don't love it. I don't think formally it's the best jacket in the world. What I do love about it is that it doesn't look like one of these. Um, and. So the point being that there are sort of tropes that people deploy when they want to signal certain kinds of mass market fiction. Um, there are colors that people use, there's kinds of typography people use, there's certain kinds of imagery, shadowy people, um, men with briefcases and overcoats, sort of ominous style things. Um, and we're used to seeing these are the signifiers. Um, and I hate them, and they're all cliches, and I hate them because they're cliches. So the, I'd say the only real sort of saving grace of this jacket is that, well, it's bright yellow. So, um, and this goes to a certain principle that I, I think about often when I think about designing covers, which is this. Um, you're trying to get the reader's attention, and the best way to get anybody's attention is to make the thing that is getting their attention stand out. And what I mean by stand out is tautologically be different from the things that lie on either side of it. So, you know, there's a, there's a kind of school of thought that you encounter in marketing meetings in particular that say that, oh, this is mass market crime, it should look like mass market crime. However, I am of the school that, you know, it should just, it should be as different from all the other books around it as it possibly can be, and therefore will appeal to sort of the magpie in the shopper, and they'll get closer to it, and they'll pick it up and investigate it, and um, I'm told at least when a book is in a consumer's hands, you've gone a long way towards making a sale, so that's one thing. Um, here's another example of sort of a mass market uh, mystery jacket, and again, you know, the interesting thing here is in, in trying to not use cliches, what I'm really trying to do is boil those tropes, those cliches, those signifiers down to their essence. What is the smallest little nod that I can make towards the genre cliche? Uh, with crime, it turns out to be blood. Um, you can make a cover with a pony or a daisy or a puppy on it, and you put a little drop of blood on it, all of a sudden it's crime fiction. It turns out. Um, so, you know, here we have a very violent Grand Guignol Nordic uh, mystery crime uh, novel, and, uh, you know, without that little drop there, it could be YA, it could be a kid's book. Um, so again, in order to make the cover look different and avoid the cliches and the, the road most traveled, um, again, I'm trying to find that the, the smallest signifier possible. Um, of course, sometimes I have to do things, celebrity-driven books, um, where they just are what they are. I do a fair amount of these as well because it's my job. Um, and these are easy. You put a photo of someone on a cover and you put some type on it. Um, 
but I don't love doing them. Um, I work on a lot of history books, uh, literary nonfiction. Um, this is a, a book by my friend Jim Glick about the history of the idea of information. Um, and the idea is to show the, you know, just typographically sort of the flood that is the information age. Um, social commentary and criticism, uh, biography. This is a book by the late Thomas Bernhardt. Uh, it was just a genius, but a miserable person. And this is a, a, a book about how unhappy he was receiving awards. <clears throat> uh, here's another biography, this of, of Alan Turing, recently um, in the limelight for that Benedict Cumberbatch movie. Um, and this particular uh, book uh, takes advantage of what I like to think of as the inherent drama of a jacket covering something. So here, there's a jacket that's punched like a like a uh, like a punch card, like a you know proto computer uh, input device. And behind it, then you have Mr. Mr. Turing, Saint Turing. Um, here's another example of a jacket that does something. This is a work of philosophy and psychology. Um, by the married couple Simon Critchley and Jameson Webster, and it's, uh, you know, Hamlet is the central idea here, and the, the, the knight, the, the ghost of the dad, is just on this sort of semi-translucent jacket, so it, it covers the book that way. Um, I work on a lot of psychology, neuro, psych, cognitive psychology, cognitive philosophy books, especially when I was at Pantheon Books, we do a ton of those, um, and Basically, they were all just, you know, try to come up with a metaphor for cognition, for sentience, which is really hard, it turns out. And I've done hundreds of these, and I just don't have any more in me. So, and I don't work in that job anymore, which is great, but I've tried everything, mirrors, flames, flames and mirrors. Um, so, uh, I'm done with those. Architecture books, um, always fun to work on. Um, the book as building, um, the late Herbert Mouchamp. Um, poetry books, this is, you know, another thing I, I, I think about a lot as a cover designer is, you know, where does the text begin? Um, and why can't it begin on the front? Uh, I love the idea of the immediacy of someone picking up a book and the reading experience starting without even having to go through that, that liminal kind of veil that is the cover. So here you have, you know, a beautiful, powerful poem that's right on the front of the book. And if that doesn't lead you into it, I don't, I don't know what does. Um, more poetry, this is Basho, Nine Moons, Nine Circles. Um, this is, colors are kind of strange here, it's actually not brown but pink. Um, anyway, this is the only cover I've ever designed that has moving parts. This was for Mark Haddon who wrote The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. Um, there's a grommet in the middle and a scroll wheel. Here's some um, details you can sort of see, you can sort of scroll through this kind of serial title and each one gives you a different picture. Um, really fun to make. Um, a nightmare to produce and ship. Um, and I even get to work on music books. Um, this is Matthew Guerrieri's wonderful book on uh, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, The First Four Notes. Dun, 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 dun. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, strangely, as a side note, this was a book that I was actually asked to write myself. I had been doing some of the music reads for various books at Knopf, and one of the editors uh, had talked to me about this idea of writing a book about the sort of cultural significance of the first four notes of Beethoven's Symphony, and I thought, oh, this will be great. And I got about two months into it and gave up and ended up finding someone better to write it, who is this, this fellow here. Um, which I guess just goes to show that, you know, I mean, they say everybody has a book in them, but it's gotta be, it's gotta be your topic, and this definitely was not mine. Um, uh, Sir John Eliot's uh, Bach, uh, Wonderful, wonderful book. Um, another recent music book I worked on. Um, and a lot of literary fiction. I work on a ton of literary fiction. Knopf publishes just fantastic literary fiction. These are always very fun to work on. This is Martin Amis' uh, penultimate novel about sort of a lout who lives in, a, in council housing in London. And it's sort of a state of the union about England. So it seemed like a red top tabloid was a pretty good way to exemplify that. Um, here's his most recent book, which is a love story that's set in Auschwitz. I'll just let that resonate. Um, and the idea here was actually to do something sort of disjointedly musical here as well. And it was sort of a, sta a staff that, uh, 
that got that sort of just turned into barbed wire. Um, and it's sort of an homage to what I would I think of as mom, you, and dad's sort of collection of great uh, post-war uh, novels, Life and Fate, and you know, um, Solzhenitsyn, and all those great big jackets that I remember on my shelf when I was a kid. Um, uh, you know, sometimes I get to do really crazy stuff with literary fiction, which is another reason I like it. This is Ben Marcus's two most recent books, and they're made out of cut paper. My job is really ridiculous. Sometimes my, my kids will come to work and they'll see what I'm doing. I'm cutting paper. It's pretty amazing, and they pay me to do it. It's just completely nuts. Um, here's a wonderful book by Jesse Ball. Um, one thing I try to do is, uh, you know, there's sort of two big elements on a cover. There's, there's image and there's text. And text can be image, um, but what I like to try to do is have one recede and the other come to the fore. You know, there's sort of a funny guy, straight man sort of relationship. One of them's gonna star, um, because they really both can't at the same time. Um, so in this case, you can see that I've tried to minimize the type as much as possible, and the book as face, it works wonderfully. Um, Nostalgia is a great Civil War novel by Dennis McFarland. Uh, Nostalgia, it turns out, is, or was, a diagnosis, actually. It means PTSD. Um, sort of a strange constellation of symptoms we now know as PTSD. Um, so this is an attempt to use an old piece of art and manipulate it in such a way as to give a sense of sort of the fog of war. Um, so the only interesting thing about this book is really the spine, which is really great real estate on a book. On a, you know, when, when you're selling books, mostly they're spine out, as Jeanette can attest. Uh, it's great to have books in bookstores uh, be face up, but most of the time they're on shelves, so it's just a wonderful, it's a wonderful space that I feel like publishers don't really utilize to its fullest extent. Uh, here's an example of typography being really the, 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 the lead here, um, Things We Didn't See Coming by Stephen Amsterdam. Um, uh, if I can do it all with type, I prefer to. And actually the truth is if I, I just, you know, the, the less I can do on a cover, the better. I think you'll see as we go along that the things at least that I will profess to liking the most are the things that um, don't involve me very much, where there's very little going on. This is science fiction. Um, you know, I work on a lot of sort of far-flung, post-colonial, coming-of-age kinds of fiction. Um, two books from India, uh, a book from Kenya. Um, and I just show these because, again, this is what I'm trying not to do. So. Um, the continent of Africa and all of its diversity, um, with all the diversity of its literature, not to mention ethnicity, um, whoever you are, you're writing a book, it's going to get an acacia tree and a sunset, um, which is just awful. And a ditto India, you get the woman with the bindi. Um, so again, you know, just trying in some way, you know, the nods are there, but in some way to try to make something that's beautiful and different and is respectful of the material, obviously. Um, occasionally I get to work on really kind of expensive, um, you know, real art books. Uh, this is Mark Danielewski's 50 Year Sword. It has five latches. Um, the jacket is perforated. Um, the, the protagonist in the story is a seamstress, so I loved this idea of the jacket being punctured in this way. Um, and actually we had to make a wheel with spikes on it that punctured each jacket uniquely as it came off of the press. Um, and, you know, this was a hundred dollar book and we made a thousand of them and they sold out in a week or two. So, which is to say, I think that there is a model for making durable, beautiful objects because people still want books that are corporeal, um, if well made. Um, I also, as Jeanette said, work as the art director of Vertical Press, which is an independent Japanese press. This job, mostly my job, is to work on manga. I don't know if you guys know what manga is. It's a form of Japanese um, illustration. Um, and, and this is an incredibly fun job for me. Um, and they really let me do what I want to do. So, um, and this is an example of what we call J-horror. Um, again, typography, how much you can do with typography. Um, okay, but the thing I love working on the most is what we call the backlist. It's, and the backlist is sort of like the canonical classics, those books, the long tail of publishing, which is those books that are in paperback and hopefully will 
be in paperback forever and ever and ever. Although, who knows now with ebooks, um, they're definitely cannibalizing that market. But uh, there's a couple of reasons I love to work on these books. One of them is that most of the authors are dead and so can't interfere with me, which is. I mean, I, I really love working with, for the record, all the authors I get to work with, except I don't really because, I, I, you know, the thing is, writers, for the most part, are really great at what they do. And I have my job and they have theirs. And, and you know, sometimes we find common ground. I hope that they come around to liking the things that I do. I found most of the time that it works out for me that way, which is great. But quite often in my job, I'm contending with the dog of the butler of the wife of the author doesn't like the color blue, which is just the worst. Um, so if I can minimize, if I can disintermediate as many people as possible, that's sort of my goal in life, or my goal in the job anyway. So that's one great thing about the canonical classics. The author can't interfere. The other great thing is they're classics. So there's a bang for buck quality to getting to read this stuff. I mean, I have to read a ton of manuscripts and I just want to read things that I love, um, that I know are going to be of quality. Um, here we have Simone de Beauvoir. There's three books that were in the Pantheon backlist, uh, which were going out of print. And I just pulled them out and said, you know, guys, it really wouldn't cost us that much to just rejacket these. So um, why don't we give it a shot? The Woman Destroyed, a Very Easy Death, which is about the, sort of a log of the death of her parent, and Adieu, which is about her relationship with Jean-Paul Sartre and about Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, and so we put out these books. It costs nothing to recover them. And in fact, The Woman Destroyed was one of McNally Jackson's best-selling books of the year. So from not selling at all and going out of print to that's the power of a cover, which is great. I mean, covers are incredibly frivolous, ridiculous things, but it's nice if they can, if they can help sell a good book. Um, here we have Marguerite Duras incredible book, The Lover, um, which is a Roma Clef, a novel that's just sort of a thinly veiled autobiography about her relationship with a, uh, a Chinese man when she was living in Southeast Asia as a young girl, which I've always found it so fascinating that she had this particular picture on the cover of the first edition. So it's a novel that everybody knows is an autobiography that has her picture on the front. But it's also just such an incredible picture. Um, so I stayed with it for this particular version. And I liked the idea of her having to sort of gaze through her own text. Um, the great late Hungarian writer Sándor Murai, um, Nikolai Leskov. Uh, I work with the, the translators Pavir and Volkonsky, who have translated all of Dostoevsky, Tolstoy. Um, they, they have changed this literature for me. Um, you know, if you've grown up reading the Constance Garnett, um, you know, read some of these books again, because they're different than you remember them. Specifically, Dostoevsky becomes very full-blooded in their, in their version. Um, oh, there's Lolita, look at that. So, the, you have two things here. You have the poem in the back, which is the poem Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe, which H.H. Uh, refers to in the story uh, when he's recalling sort of the moment when he became obsessed with what he calls nymphets, and it's about this sort of abortive love affair he has with this young girl on holiday, and, and he, she becomes his Annabelle Lee, and so that poem is there. And then the handwriting is a child's handwriting, uh, which is a very purposeful move on my part. It's to remind you that this is a story of statutory rape, not to put too fine a point on it. It's a, it's a beautiful book, but it's a very disturbing and ugly book too, and I think we, as a culture, have been very caught up in the sort of the salaciousness of the story, which wasn't, I think, Nabokov's project. Um, and I liked the idea of bringing some of the discomfort back towards a reading of this book. Um, here we have two versions of Plato's Republic. The one on the right is the one that ended up going to press, although I really liked that little allegory of the cave on the left. Um, but they weren't having it. Um, so again, Dostoevsky, this is the Pavir Volkonsky. I was trying to avoid sort of the, you know, either the bearded portrait of Dostoevsky or the kind of kulaks in the snow type deal that you normally see on these kinds of things. Um, and I was thinking, well, what's the most radical thing I could do for Dostoevsky? And it was really suprematism um, and, you know, to try to use shape uh, to, to make these ideas palpable. So the whole series looks like this. Again, as little as, little as I can do, um, the, 
their War and Peace is on the left, which landed on the bestseller list, which was very gratifying. Um, their Dr. Shivago on the right. Um, Walter Benjamin, a, <clears throat> a favorite of mine. That's sort of how I sketch things. How are we on time, by the way? Are we okay? Yeah, we have time, right? We doing okay? Anybody getting bored? Um, and we'll, we'll do questions at the end if we have time, if you guys want to do that. Um, so normally what I do is I, I have sort of a pad of paper that just has rectangles on it. And in these rectangles, I will just sketch very broadly these ideas. And for Walter Benjamin, I was sort of thinking, well, what's the idea that can encapsulate his, his various essays? And I thought of various things, the angel of history and, and, and such, arcades. Um, but the idea of a map, a kind of idealized map that his Flanner can walk around. Um, so we redid his books all as maps. And you can't see on this, unfortunately, on this projector, but the essay names are the street names. Um, Michel Foucault I've done as a collection of objects. Um, so, Herculean Barbin is about a transsexual uh, discipline punish. That seems pretty self-explanatory. It's both sort of the metric of and implement for punishment. You have the ruler. Um, and so they're all various objects. Um, <clears throat> I could spend an hour just talking to you about this. This was the assignment of a lifetime for me. Huge Joyce fan. Um, and Again, I just started out trying to do as little as possible. I thought I would just set the type and that would be that. Like, how wonderful if it just said Ulysses, James Joyce, end of story. But because I'm a finicky designer, I just had to do something else. And I saw that embedded yes. And it brought to mind just this endless debate about this book, about whether this day, this single day, what's the point of writing about it? Is this, a, is this a, you know, what, hap what happens at the end of the book is inconclusive. So is this a yay saying statement on Joyce's part? Or are we supposed to believe that the lives of these people who sort of cycle around one another in Dublin on this day, that they end up lonely, that, that the, the end of the story is just, you know, depression and heartbreak? It, you know, there are two camps. And my camp has always been that he, re he ended with Molly for a reason. And that reason is that everything's going to be OK. And the, the full, the full-bodied, unspoken word yes at the end of this book was the most important and emblematic moment, not just for me, but I think for most readers. And the fact that it was embedded in the word I think is interesting. I mean, Joyce, the idea of words embedded in other words was an obsession of his, but it became his working methodology for everything after Ulysses, meaning the wake, um, in which almost every word on the page is made up of not just two, but multiple words. And there are acrostics in this book and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, as I said, I would not talk for a full hour about this, but it was a great joy to work on. And I liked the, the idea, too, of something that looks classical being sort of scrawled on, graffitied on in that particularly insouciant and violent kind of way. Um, I think that sort of suits Joyce's project as well. Uh, here are the others. Um, uh, Kafka, this for me was a real um, wonderful thing to be able to work on, mostly because Kafka sort of traditionally had been jacketed in a way that emphasized, well, what we think of when we think of that, that oft and ill-used word Kafka-esque, sort of, you know, t totalitarianism, bu bureaucracy, sort of the, the disenfranchised, which is, of course is a big aspect of Kafka's work, but so is humor and lightheartedness and ingenuity and so the idea of using color was really the big thing sort of like open the window let some of the light back into this project and hopefully people would come to Kafka with a slightly less gloomy aspect about them um, and eyes I just like the idea of turning the gaze back on the viewer um, and this idea came from a very particular line that I read in a book um, by Roberto Colasso about Kafka, in which he said that the sort of the key to Kafka is that all of his books depend on the idea of election or selection. You, you are unfortunately elected or selected. And so this idea of being seen and being, being therefore seen and punished, I thought, was an interesting one. And I also just liked the idea of a, someone going into a bookstore and being confronted with something looking back at them. So that's Kafka. This, I think, is probably the most successful book jacket I've ever worked on, which still hasn't been printed, which I can't believe. But um, 
And by successful, I just mean, again, the most with the least. Um, you know, it's two colors, and, and, and hopefully that gives you the, the breadth of Dante's entire tale without giving anything away or getting too much into specifics. And I'm very, very opposed to this idea of book jackets showing you things from the narrative um, because that's a form of robbery. And I, I think obviously we all know that we like to read fiction because we like to make these things our own. So why would you want a stupid book designer showing you what, what your Beatrice looks like? Um, this is the great Julio Cortazar's Hopscotch. Um, this is the final book jacket. It's a hopscotch field, a, a rayuela, as they say in Spanish, with a tango on top of it. Um, and just so you know, these things don't, they don't come to me in one shot. Um, you know, normally once I've decided, okay, I'm gonna do a hopscotch field, I play a lot, and not just with color, but stylistically, you can see that there are sort of Miro things happening and various kinds of pop art things happening and maybe it's a photograph, maybe it's a grid of a photograph. Um, I try lots of stuff and most of it gets thrown out and that's my job. Um, and especially if I really care about the book, as I did with this one, um, I'll, I'll do comp after comp. There were probably hundreds and hundreds of these before I finally said, I think this is the jacket. Um, so, if we have time, I'd love to just talk to you about a recent project that I worked on, which is I was approached to work on the complete backlist of the great Italian writer and editor, Italo Calvino, who's always been a favorite of mine. Um, and I was approached by his publisher and by his daughter, Giovanna, who's um, now a friend, um, to do it. And it was a huge labor of love. I discovered Calvino in college, I think like a lot of people do. Um, and I came to him first via his sort of semiotic, metafictional works, If on a Winter's Night a Traveler, Invisible Cities, um, and just fell in love instantly. Um, and assumed from then on that all of Calvino's books were books about books. That there were books that confronted other books, but also books that confronted the fact, as you were reading them, that you were reading a book. And they let you know that you were reading a book. And they pointed up the artifice of that um, and the best example, of course, is If on a Winter's Night, which opens, you are about to begin reading Italo Calvino's If on a Winter's Night at Traveler. Are you comfortable? Do you need to pee? It addresses you directly. So my first idea for these covers was to do books on books, books embedded in books. Um, and I literally thought, and this was way too clever to actually work, but I actually thought what would be great is if we took the old book covers <laughs> and we just cataloged them, and those would be the new book covers. So each one would have sort of a catalog number, and there'd be a, f so held at sort of critical arm's length by photography. Um, but, you know, sometimes you're trying too hard. Uh, Invisible Cities obviously would have nothing on it. Um, but then I thought, okay, well, what about, what about, um, what about uh, pretend books, books that don't exist, imaginary books, imaginary ephemera? So I started to sort of put together a bunch of uh, kinds of pieces of ephemera that could possibly represent these books of Italo Calvino's. And although I think this was a profitable direction, ultimately uh, it didn't feel like exactly the way I wanted to go. Um, now I'm gonna describe to you a book cover. Ready? This, this book is Mr. Palomar. I don't know if anybody's read it. But here's the book cover, okay? I'm not gonna show it to you, I'm just gonna describe it to you. There's a photograph on this cover. The photo is of a table in a well-lit white room. On the table, there are several artifacts labeled with small tags. These items are a bedroom slipper, a hand mirror, a green-veined cheese, a starling, a small square patch of lawn, a brass telescope, a gecko, an antique orrery, a Pyrex beaker of seawater, a human skull. Not obvious at first is the faint shadow of the photographer cast obliquely over the table. So my next idea for Calvino was to have descriptive book covers. Um, and this was, I think, the most Calvino-esque idea I have ever had in my life. And I really kind of fell in love with the idea. It was one of those real like coup de food moments. I was on the subway and I was like, oh my God, I don't need imagery at all. Um, and there is something just so wonderfully evocative about this method of packaging books. I mean, it really doesn't interfere with the reader's 
uh, special private relationship with the text. Um, and like Calvino's work, it sort of points at the weird artifice that is, you know, that is literature. It's power to create imagery. It's magic. Um, and so I, I could read you the rest of these, but I, I then proceeded to describe book covers for the works of Italo Calvino. And we were doing great. The Calvinos loved it, and uh, Houghton Mifflin loved it, and in the end, sadly, I got an email that said something like, but what is it gonna look like on Amazon? I don't know if Amazon specifically objected, but that's just the bane of my existence when that happens. But it was, I'm dying to use this on something else, but it was really, it should be Italo Calvino's idea, because it's, it's, it, it is the kind of thing I just would imagine that he would have loved. Um, so there are more of them. Okay, so my next idea was, okay, um, again, I'm gonna just, we'll start with the text. Let's just put the opening paragraph on the, on the cover. And opening paragraphs for Calvino's books are wonderful. Um, but I'm a designer, again, so I gotta start screwing around and I start putting shapes over things. And well, that's a, sort of an interesting shape and what would they look like if the shapes went over the text and put a line through that and sort of a tree and then all of a sudden it's kind of a sword. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting, a shape that intersects with a line and all of a sudden it has sort of a dual meaning. And this became then the way that we made Italo Calvino, which was basically, and these are very much inspired by Calder, who I think is very much a kindred spirit to Calvino, very whimsical and very interested in the ways in which popular forms can be intellectually satisfying um, and uh, just has such a great sense of fun and whimsy. Um, so each one of these starts really with a line. Um, there's a wonderful story in Cosmo Comics called The Distance to the Moon, which is one of my favorite Calvino stories. Um, and in this story, he, from a, uh, he posits this fact that the moon, in fact, it used to be marginally closer to the Earth, and he, he imagines, well, what if it was really close to the Earth, and what if there was this picaresque story of a bunch of villagers who go out in a boat at night with long ladders, and they climb these ladders, and they jump to the moon, and they harvest its crazy material, and they jump back into the ocean and climb into their boats, and um, it's a beautiful story. So I started to draw waves, and, and remember, this is Cosma Comics, and so, that's what you get. You get the moon and the waves inside the moon, which becomes a cartoon, it's a comic. So again, here we have difficult loves, and I started with the most cliched thing imaginable, and what happens when you, oh yeah, that could have happened. What happens when you add line, you know, things change. You add one little stroke of the pen, and all of a sudden you have something different. Um, and they were all painted by hand, they're all gouached. Um, so, Numbers in the Dark, Road to San Giovanni, uh, why read the classics? You have the book as column. A hermit in Paris, literally the negative space of the Eiffel Tower is your hermitage. Um, Into the War, Collection of Sand, um, The Written World and the Unwritten World, speaking of Saul Steinberg, who did the cover of this original text and is featured in a couple of Italo Calvino's essays. So that really, that the flower inside the pen is really an homage to him. Uh, and here are the rest of them. Um, six memos for the next millennium. You have the setting sun, which is the place you, I don't know what hole punched things, <laughs> whatever, there's probably a better word for that. Um, and uses of literature. And If on a Winter's Night, again, you are about to read Italo Calvino's If on a Winter's Night, a Traveler. How do you convey that you? And that's through a mirror. So the book is a mirrored foil, so you can see yourself or whatever you put in it. Invisible Cities, that bird is the only thing that's actually really printed other than the type on the jacket. Um, the rest of it's just blind debossed, is pushed into the paper. So there's no, there's no city except for the implied city. Um, very briefly, uh, some other things that I've been working on, uh, again, text on a jacket. In this case, you know, story collections in this country, generally speaking, the way they're jacketed is that you have a huge laundry list of the various authors on the front, like that's a big selling tool. In this case, that went on the spine and I commissioned the editor, Ben Marcus, to write. I just said to him, well, what, why, why do you think stories are important? And so he wrote a paragraph, and it's now on the front of this book. Um, this is a forthcoming novel by a young novelist. 
uh, coming of age tale in California in the late 60s. It turns out to be sort of, well, that's late 60s. It's really the death of the 60s. And of course, she becomes embroiled in that event that is emblematic of the death of the 60s, the, 60s, the Manson murders. So what is lipstick, as you read, becomes slightly more ominous. Um, the most recent David Mitchell, I just worked on another one of his. He's an incredibly fast writer, um, because this came out pretty recently. But there's a new one coming. Um, Kazushiguro's new book, which I really recommend. It's just incredible. And like I was saying to the nice, kind bookseller in the hallway, has just not gotten the review it deserves. Both the praiseworthy reviews and the negative reviews have gotten the book totally wrong. It is a masterpiece of symbolist experiment. It is not genre fiction of any kind. It is, it is ish at his best. I really highly recommend it. Um, series of essays, I mean, like I said, I get to work with the authors pretty closely. In this case, I got to put a sign around his neck and put him in a photo studio. That quote, I am sorry to think I've raised a timid son, which is the title of his book, is something that Daniel Boone said to his own son upon hearing that his own son had not volunteered for a battle that turned into a massacre. Thanks, Dad. Um, novel by Daniel Kalman. Uh, scary, scary, oh my god. That image, right? Everybody does that when they see it. He's just, what a thug. Um, Tom McCarthy, uh, wonderful, wonderful new book of, I guess I would call it experimental fiction. He would kill me for saying that, but it's a brilliant book. Um, uh, I also work on other things other than books, um, working for the Criterion Collection right now, doing films, uh, the backlist of Errol Morris's films, this is Thin Blue Line, sort of seminal true crime movie. Uh, I just did this for The New Yorker. Um, I've done a fair amount of magazine covers over the years, but A New Yorker is pretty, feels pretty special. I, I was saying to my mom who was here, you just feel like, you feel like that that girl from Iowa who steps off the bus and she's looking around the big city and she thinks, someday I'll make it here. And then, anyway, this was really fun to work on. This is their 90th anniversary. Uh, and here are some of the also-rans that I made. Um, uh, and this is a book by the great tenor Ian Bostrich about Schubert's Winterreise song cycle. Um, it's very hard to see. There's, there's also on this cover a blind deboss. The footprints in the snow are just pressed into the paper without ink. Um, and I just put this on here because I like this cover, but also because, oh, there you can see in the detail a little bit more. I also put it on here because it's actually strangely led me back to the piano. So Ian came to town. Um, he's coming back to do something at the Armory in a couple weeks, but he came to town to do something at the 92nd Street Y after a series of gala performances at the Barbican sold out, and he did a concert with me in my living room in which we performed Schubert's Winterreise. And strangely, um, literature and this job doing designs for literature has brought me right back to where I began. Um, uh, Murakami wrote a book recently uh, that centers on a work of Franz Liszt's, and when it came time to do um, a short film about this book, um, I was asked to record the piece. So, um, you can't really hear, sadly, but all of a sudden, after all these years, here I am again, which is totally crazy. But um, the more I'm doing it, the more I'm wanting to do it. So, in life's crazy cyclical way, here I am. Um, so you don't need to hear any more of that. And, no, uh, let's... Right, that leads me to my books. So I already told you about these two books, which I neurotically put out on the same day. Um, and I like to say, well, if they were terrible, at least I would still be the two books one day guy. So I've got that going for me. The one on the left is my monograph, and you can see it's pictures of my work. They're essays by me. They're behind the scenes kind of looks at how I do what I do. They're essays by writers who, whose books I've worked on. Um, uh, that's my daughter Violet's hair. You sort of see how the sausage is made, as it were. Um, and then the other book is What We See When We Read, um, which I've already described a little bit to you, some of the issues that crop up there. And if I might, I might just conclude with a very brief reading from that, unless you want to go straight into a Q&A. Would you, do, would you guys want to hear a little bit from the book? Or All right, so um, I'm going to just snake this microphone back over here, so you can see what I look like, poor people. Um, Sorry, Jeanette, I think, there we go. Okay, 
So I'm going to just read a very brief passage. So again, I sort of touched on this idea of co-creation, that um, the big, one of the biggest sort of myths that we're told about the reading experience is that it's passive, that it's passive and that it's optical. And these are two things that the reading experience is not, in fact, obviously to me, and I assume to you as well, the, the reader brings much of, of what is seen in quotes, what is imagined to the table. And much of that imagining comes from our memory because where else would it come from? So this is a brief passage uh, from what we see when we read about that. <clears throat> I'm reading again, Our Mutual Friend by Charles Dickens. And I'm imagining something from the book, an industrial harbor, a river, boats, wharves, warehouses, where does the material for my picturing this scene derive from? I search my memory to find a similar place with similar docks, and it takes a while, but I remember a trip I took with my family when I was a child. There was a river and a dock. It's the same dock as the one I just imagined. I realized later that when a new friend describes to me his home in Spain with its docks, that I was picturing the same dock, the one I saw on my childhood vacation, the dock I used already in imagining the novel I am reading. How many times have I used this dock? The act of picturing the events and trappings of fiction delivers unintentional glimpses into our pasts. And we may search our imaginings as we search our dreams for hints and fragments of lost experience. Words are effective not because of what they carry in them, but for their latent potential to unlock this accumulated experience. The experiences which belong to the reader Words contain meaning, but more important, words potentiate meaning. River, the word, contains within it all rivers, which flow like tributaries into it. And this word contains not only all rivers, but more important, all of my rivers. Every accessible experience of every river I've seen, swam in, fished, heard, heard about, felt directly or been affected by in any other manner, oblique, secondhand, or otherwise. These rivers are infinitely tessellating rills and affluents that feed fiction's ability to spur the imagination. I read the word river, and with or without context, I'll dip beneath its surface. I'm a child waiting in the moil and suck, my feet cut on a river's rock bottom. Or the gray river just out the window now, just to my right, over the trees of the park, spackled with ice. Or the almost seismic eroticism of a memory from my teens, of the shift of a skirt of a girl in spring on a quay by an arabesque of a river in a foreign city. This is the word's dormant power brimming with pertinence. So little is needed from the author when you think of it. We are flooded by river water and only need the author to tap the reservoir. Thank you. So should we just do a little Q&A? Does that sound okay if we have time? I'd be willing to, if one of you is brave enough to, no one ever wants to ask the first question, except for two people do. Yes. Um. That's a great question. So the question was about typography. There are so many fonts that are available to us, as anybody who uses Microsoft Word knows. Um, how do you choose the fonts that you choose? You know, fonts have character and history and um, various affects of their own. And, you know, who makes the decision? That, that's really the, I think that was the sum of the question, which is a great question. Um, I make those decisions and I make them uh, for different reasons depending on the context. I mean, sometimes a typeface will have a historical significance, as you said, which will seem like, let's say it's a work of historical fiction, and let's say it's set around the time that Garamond was stamped, then Garamond might be a good typeface for that. It might be, it may not be, but that, that could be one reason to use that particular typeface. Um, you know, the other thing is just the accretion of meaning that we've developed around different kinds of type styles 
like I said, signifiers, right? So um, certain kinds of books use sans serif fonts and certain kinds of books, certain genres of books use serif typography. We've just grown used to that. So sometimes I'll just choose a font because it will allow me, by carrying the weight of that sort of genre signification, to do other things on the jacket. Um, most often, and probably a little idiosyncratically, I like to just use the most boring fonts available to me, mainly because it just lets them get out of the way. So the things that are preloaded on your computer, like Times New Roman and Helvetica, I love those typefaces, because they're just vanilla. You see past them. So either to the information or to the imagery that surrounds the typography or both. So that's my particular proclivity. These days, like you saw in the Calvinos, I'm way more interested in um, making the type by hand. Um, I just, you know, the, the actual sensual labor of making things by hand is, can't be, it's, you know, just it doesn't compare to typing something into a computer. Um, it's much more fun. I enjoy it a lot more. That's a great question, thank you. Yeah, you in the back, you had something. Yes. <laughs> wow, this is the first time I've been, I've been on tour since August. No one has ever asked me about Sunny. This is great. Oh, this is on film, isn't it? Um, so the first question was, while I was learning design, was there, were there other designers from the past or present who were influential and helpful to me in terms of being models of some kind? The second part was asking about my boss, who was the president of Knopf, Sunny Mehta. Um, to the first question, um, I mean, the biggest way that I learned how to design was by looking at other designers' works, certainly. I mean, I just, you know, you, you look around, you see what you like, you see what you don't like. Um, and you make note of why the th how the things that you like worked um, and how the things you didn't like failed. Um, so certainly, and the, of the designers who I saw, whose work I really loved, I would point to two in particular. One is Paul Rand, um, who is a great favorite of mine, whose work is fantastically smart. Um, and there's a great show right now at the Museum of the City of New York that just opened of Paul Rand's work. Um, go take a look. Um, I'm speaking on a panel there at the beginning of June about his work. His work is gorgeous. Uh, the other is Alvin Lustig, who was um, a wonderful American designer who worked for New Directions and most notably did their book covers in the sort of mid-50s to early 60s. Um, uh, the New Direction classics, um, and they're, you know, they were the sort of the first real abstract book covers I remember seeing. Um, when I was learning how to design, a lot of book covers were photographs. Um, for whatever reason, that was a time where the photograph had just come back onto book jackets after, you know, book jackets had been illustrative since their beginning, and then there was sort of evidently this sort of refreshing moment where people started putting photos on book covers. Um, that was just prior to when I started. And when I got there, I was like, why all the photos on book covers? Let's put some illustrations back on. Let's have them be abstract. Um, and Alvin Lustig was definitely the model for me. Um, look him up. Uh, it's L-U-S-T-I-G. Um, and his work is absolutely beautiful. And you'll recognize it as soon as you see it, I promise. Um, and now to the second question, Sunny Mehta. Um, I love Sunny. I love my boss. He's sort of notoriously unapproachable, cranky, difficult, um, all of that's true. Um, and I don't know if I get a pass because I'm in the art department or I don't, I don't know what, but I've spent a lot of time in his office, a lot of time in his office, sometimes just shooting the breeze and it's the relationship that I cherish most in the business. Um, what I've learned from him is frankly just about everything. I've never met anybody who's so smart about putting books out into the world, about knowing how to highlight the particular idiosyncratic merits of every book that we publish. Um, he's just very, very good at what he does. And, you know, despite the, like, the moods and the tempers and all that, like, he turns out to be an extremely fair and even-handed guy. And it's, it's, 
you know, I, I dread the moment when we're not working closely together anymore. So it's, it's been wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So the, 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 right, the question was really about, you know, the relationship between me and authors and, you know, what authors can add and just, I'm going to expand a little bit on that. Um, but that quote is not mine. That's actually Ben Marcus who wrote that. Um, and <clears throat> let's see. There's a couple of things. One is that um, not everybody is, you know, my job is to think every moment of the day about the visual world, and even more specifically, how that relates to selling literature. Um, that's not most authors, that's not how they spend their time. Um, so I think in some ways I just have a leg up in that regard. Uh, but the other thing is that I found really interesting is that, and editors will corroborate, the author is not always the best judge of what their book is. I mean, most of the time you have, um, that's not always the case, obviously, I'm generalizing, but you know, when I, when I enter the author's life, they've been alone perhaps for years with this thing that they've been building, and all of a sudden, it's gonna be made public, and I am, I am the first member of that public, along with the editor, to encounter this manuscript, and it's a very challenging moment. Um, but it's also interesting because I have many, many times, you know, some authors who I've read and admired my whole life, will describe their work to me and I'll just think, oh my God, that's not at all what you write. You know, fantasists will describe themselves as realists and, you know, it's just, um, and there is, you know, again, critical distance. Anybody that does anything creative, it's hard to get. It's the most valuable thing to have, but it's very, very hard to get. So there are occasions where I have to, in the, this process of midwifery, of bringing this book out into the world, I have to very gently just say, have you considered that perhaps this book might be X, Y, or Z? And it's a conversation. I don't get to make any decisions unilaterally, just so you know. I am somewhere like two-thirds of the way down the totem pole. I'm really like towards the bottom of a little bit above the mail room. I'm not, I'm not the guy that has supreme power over these things. But I do like to speak my mind when I feel strongly about these matters that I care about. And I really do feel like I have the ability to help some of these people's work get into more hands, which ultimately is my job. Um, so, but there have been many occasions where authors have helped me hugely. Um, you know, even just today, someone made a very small suggestion about something typographic and I tried it and I was like, wow, it's great, fantastic. I'm hugely open to that. It's just easy to go into a real kind of spiral of thought with an author, have you tried this in red? Have you tried it in yellow? What if this were up here? What? I say, you know, I, I either cut out those steps because I know that they won't be profitable or I tried them already. Um, and I don't like being a pair of hands for someone else's, you know, the guy, I'm, I don't like to be the guy on the mouse. Um, so, but it's always, each time out's a learning experience and it's like any, it's not like any relationship, right? I mean, it depends on the two people and their particular chemistry, so. Um, Wow, a lot of questions all of a sudden. Not you yet. <laughs> I'll get to you. <laughs> um, uh, how about, yes, you. Thank you. Well, I'll tell you, uh, that's a great question. How do you have a fresh eye if you're doing so many versions of cover before you actually land on something that you think will work? Um, the answer is I work in volume, meaning I'm not working on one book at one time. I'm working on a lot of projects at one time, a lot of different authors. So, you know, not just different authors, but different genres and, you know, different kinds of prose and um, different markets. And so it's a wonderful form of forgetting, which is so important, I think, to, you know, again, when you're working on something creative, if you're writing long form, right, it's very important to forget what you've written so you can come back and edit it. Um, so, and then, you know, I'll work on something, I'll really go deep with it, and then I will forget it. I'll leave it lying around for a while. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll wrap, the, I'll print out the jacket, I'll wrap it around the book as if it's real, and I'll put it on my shelf, and I will just stumble upon it. Oh, what's this? 
Um, <laughs> but you know what I mean. You could sort of fool yourself into seeing something fresh. But it's, it's the big challenge. I mean, when I was playing music, the big challenge is to listen to yourself. It is the hardest thing to listen to yourself when you're playing. Objectivity, it's just, it's a challenge. But, you know, that is my, that's my methodology anyway. Yes, next door. No, pink, yes. Yeah. Right, okay, how many jackets do I end up presenting and who am I presenting them to? Um, I have worked very hard, low these 12 years, 13 years, to present one. And there's a reason for that. I've been asked to come up with a solution. I've worked very hard to get to that solution. I don't wanna, it's not like, well, any of these will work. <laughs> it just sends the wrong message and it's actually not true. There will be one that will, by the end, have sometimes two, sometimes two. But generally speaking, you don't wanna, you know, the other thing that happens is if you present a bunch of things at once, there's the, what I like to call the Frankenstein moment in the meeting where people are like, well, what if you took some of this and added it to some of that and then the type from this and the color from this? That would be awesome because those were the things that I loved on all those individual versions. And so they'll be great together, which always reminds me, someone made this painting of Americans were polled about their favorite things in art. Um, animals, rivers, what kinds of animals? Hippos, evidently. Americans love hippos. And some genius painter made this oil painting, which is like this Hudson River uh, school oil painting of a river and there's a hippo emerging and George Washington is on his back and it's got like all the elements that everybody loves and it's awful. So that, that's the other reason. Um, yeah, I'd like to show as few as possible. Um, yes, in the front row. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a very hard question to paraphrase. I hope you guys heard some of that. Um, no, it's a great question. Um, and I'm really glad that you got that response to the Joyce because that's exactly right. And if I did have that hour to talk about it, what I would say is that I think that the two elements of the typography in that jacket, of which that's all there is, the, sc the scrawl and the classically set type, that, and this is gonna sound very high flown, but I think that they bear the same relationship to one another that Joyce bears to the canon itself. In other words, he inserted himself like a massive arterial blockage in in what is this, was this free-flowing, yeah, right, exactly, that he, that he scrawled himself into the canon in exactly that way. Um, and so that is, in fact, it wasn't really to try to make the book more approachable, although it's good if it does. Um, so anyway, the short answer to that question is that I'm, I'm chuffed, as they say in England, that you would have that response because that's exactly the response Yes, that is exactly what I was trying to accomplish. Um, in the back, there are two. How about, let's start with you with the glasses. Uh -huh. Yes, how familiar do you have to be with the content of the book to get your, I'm neglecting this side of the room, to get your design ideas across? Uh, the answer is very, um, very. It's hugely important. Um, so I see my role as being interpretational and almost like a, translative kind of role. Um, I am making a visual version of a piece of prose. So if you don't know, hell, the plot, but then, you know, the question I always ask myself is why this book? Why did this author write this book and not another book? It's the crucial question. What's the project? Um, and in order to be able to answer that question, you have to know the book intimately. Now, that being said, the more that I do this, and, and I hesitate to say the more I'm reasonably successful at doing it, the more I have to do. Like, I'm just asked to work on a lot of books. So all of a sudden, the reading time is very hard to find. 
So all of a sudden, I'm finding that I have to use these weird kind of shorthands, and uh, you know, I'm sort of grabbing meeting as I can on the fly, and it's not ideal. It really isn't. I should be working on fewer things. Um, but um, you know, it's teaching me to read quickly, definitely. Um, so, and you know, I've had experiences where you know, I was working on a book of, I've worked on a couple of books of Peter Carey's who I love, um, and there was one book of his where the title was just so inscrutable, and I was halfway through the book, I, what does this title mean? You know, three quarters of the way through the book, what is this, four fifths of the way, I couldn't figure it out, last sentence. Last sentence, I'm like, oh! So, you gotta read the whole thing, ultimately. But that being said, you know, sometimes you're reading a history book, I often refer to like, you know, I worked on a thousand page biography of Chairman Mao, like, I know how that story ends. I don't have to. All right. Um, and in the back, there was oh, one more question. Sorry. Yes, you in the back, sir. Thank you very much. That's very kind. Yes. That's a wonderful question. Um, yeah, I the the I would start by saying that all of our experiences of art are mediated by surroundings and rituals. Um, and you know, when I go to a concert hall to hear, a, say, a classical recital, there's a ritual that's in place that involves a lot of people sitting in silence, and you know these rituals are observed, and there's a reason for them. It brings a kind of sanctity to the experience, that when you listen, you listen more closely. Um, and art galleries these days, it's, wow, it's, it's a hard, it's tough, right? Because you have to sort of elbow your way to the, I don't actually love going to museums for exactly that reason. I like to experience most of my art in solitude. I mean, that's just my preferred mode. It's not everybody's, but it's mine. Um, but that being said, there are certain kinds of experiences of art, and I would put some museum viewing experiences and definitely concert experiences in this category, where everybody sort of tacitly forces one another to lean forward and pay better attention. And that can be true of a lecture as it is of a concert, right? Um, and I think that's very important. It's a, it's a wonderful kind of peer pressure. Uh, and I think, well, you know, a, a lot of us are lazy at heart, and when you're confronted with something maybe you don't understand or is difficult or is tiresome or, and we're getting lazier by the day as a culture, frankly, I, it's great to have that support, right? to have other like-minded people rowing in the same galley as you. It forces a kind of quality of attention. And ultimately, when you're making anything, if it's a painting, or if it's a poem, or if it's a piece of music, what, you're, what you want more than anything is the quality of attention of the person that's going to be consuming what you make, the reader, the listener. So I am all for the mass art experience. I just I prefer to be lying in bed with a book. I think that's it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Jeanette. Oh, thanks for having me. It's the only way. I just, the more I do.